So we're going to start looking at figure 24.12. And this is sort of the um, watered down version of cellular respiration. This is the version that you like better, yes? It's the version I like better, actually, too. And I wish my biochemistry teacher had asked me that question instead. But you need to know this. So you will have questions about cellular respiration and the byproducts of the different reactions based on this diagram. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it'll be converted in the mitochondria, and there's, if you want to know the details, it's in there. But that will be converted in the mitochondria to acetyl coenzyme A. It's a couple of chemical reactions. And then acetyl coenzyme A is what gets fed into the Krebs cycle. So if we look at, well, let's go. Well, remember that this is like a factory. So think about a factory that's making, I don't know, teddy bears. And one department's going to make eyeballs, and one department's going to make the body, and one department's going to make the, I don't know, embellishments that go out on the outside of the teddy bear. So in order to have the finished product, I have to have all of these things, correct? But they're not necessarily going to happen this, then this, then this. I'm going to make a bunch of eyeballs. I'm going to make a bunch of teddy bear bodies. And I'm going to make a bunch of embellishments on the. So everybody's always working, but they have to be put together in that certain order in order for me to get the true end product. Does that make sense? OK, so this, it's the same thing with chemistry. All this is always going on but I need to have certain parts to start my job. And when I say start my job, I mean I need glucose to start glycolysis. I need acetyl coenzyme A to start the Krebs cycle. I need the electron carriers to feed into me so I can start the electron transport chain. Yes? So does that hopefully answer? The question? Does that answer your question? OK, so it's all kind of going on at the same time. But in order for something to happen, I need a certain part. So again, peruvic acid from glycolysis, that can, that's going to kind of meander its way into the mitochondria. And then we're going to have a reaction take place, which is not only going to give us some NADH, but it's also going to give us some carbon dioxide with the help of coenzyme A, we're going to then create acetyl coenzyme A. And that is going to then feed into the Krebs cycle. So sometimes, in some textbooks, that's almost like a separate step. But in our textbook, they don't really make it a separate step. We have an end product from glycolysis that's converted to start the Krebs cycle. Does that make sense? Who doesn't that make sense to? Good. OK. So that's, that's kind of why I like that diagram at the end, because it shows how everything works together. The arrows that come off of or go down from each of those squares, which are the main reactions, are telling us what some of the byproducts are of that reaction. So pay attention to that. Um, what are the byproducts of glycolysis? NADH and? No, no FAD from glycolysis. ATPs, those are also byproducts. So I'm actually creating two ATPs. I actually created four, believe it or not. But what did I do? I used two so that the reaction could take place. 
So the net, and that's what you see at the bottom, the net ATP from glycolysis is going to just be two ATPs. But remember, what is the most important byproduct from glycolysis that we need for the rest of the reaction? That, that pyruvic acid, exactly. You with me? Okay, so this diagram, know it, because there will be questions about it. And the questions will be, what are, you know, what are some of the byproducts, or how many net ATPs do I get from glycolysis? Those kind of questions. Okay, so is everybody clear on what, cell this is cellular respiration right here. Of course, you know it's much more detailed than that, but this is the gist of cellular respiration. And that's what you need to know. Remember, in order to keep glucose in the cell to start this whole thing, what did I have to do to it in the beginning? It was kind of small, and if I didn't do this, it was going to leave. I have to make it bigger somehow. Nobody? I have to phosphorylate it. I have to stick a phosphate on it. Remember that? And it's in the sixth carbon position. So we turn glucose, you ready for this? Into glucose 6 phosphate. So you could add that to the diagram. And then we start the whole ball going. OK? So we good? So that's glucose. Glucose, this reaction is the metabolism of glucose. Cellular respiration, glucose metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism. We see our glucose 6-phosphate production here in this diagram. Very important to keep it in. Now, is glucose the only thing I can use for this reaction? No. It's the best. It's going to give me the most ATP. But it's not the only thing. I can use. And that's what the rest of the chapter talks about. And the rest of the chapter talks about, or is entitled, glycogenesis. What's genesis mean? The beginning or the making of glucose, kind of. Glycogenolysis. What am I doing there? breaking down, or gluconeogenesis. What's that mean? What's it mean literally, do you know? Making new glucose, exactly. That's what gluconeogenesis means, making new glucose. So that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of the chapter. What we're going to talk about is how we use other molecules to sort of feed into this reaction when I don't have my best molecule. And what's that best molecule again? Yeah, those glu that glucose molecule, C6H12O6, to work with. I can wing it through several different reactions. And that's what the book talks about. So that's what those terms mean. So you should understand what those terms mean. They then talk about lipid metabolism, oxidation of glycerol and fatty acids. Remember, lipids are made of what? No, lipids are fats, but what are they made of? Glycerol and fatty acids. And when I store them in my body, when you take them in, you eat them, you're going to break them apart into those building blocks. And then you're going to store them as what? And this is brushing off some brain cells from way back when. Yeah, in the adipose tissue. But what do you store them as? 
triglycerides. Triglycerides. Glycerol and three fatty acids. So the next thing the book talks about is using those components in the reaction of cellular respiration. So this diagram shows us how we can take glycerol and fatty acids and actually use fatty acid and glycerol components to feed into the reaction of cellular respiration. So we can form from glycerol something called glyceraldehyde phosphate. And that can actually be manipulated to produce pyruvic acid. Remember, where do we get pyruvic acid from? in the ideal world from glucose metabolism. But once I get that pyruvic acid now from this source instead of the glucose source, what do I do with it? That can then meander into the mitochondria and be altered to produce acetyl coenzyme A. We can also use fatty acids with a little bit more manipulation A process called beta oxidation will occur. And I need some water for that, and I need some energy for that, and I need some enzymes for that. But I can also use fatty acids to then produce acetyl coenzyme A as well. You see how that works? which can then feed into the Krebs cycle and do the rest of the reaction that we need. <clears throat> what else am I going to um, get from beta oxidation of fatty acids? I'm going to get some electrons that can then be carried by the electron carriers, NAD and FAD. So lipids can be used and that's what they talk about under lipogenesis and lipolysis. So what's lipogenesis? I just went to friendlies. Does that give you a hint? <laughs> Genesis. Making. Yes? So I went to friendlies. Got that wonderful giant peanut butter sundae. Yes? All right. Lots of glucose molecules in that thing. What am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to use some of the glucose molecules for cellular respiration, but whatever's left over, and believe me, there's going to be plenty left over. What am I going to do with it? Store it as. And what is the process called in which I'm going to take that extra glucose and store it as fat? Lipogenesis. Exactly. The making of new fat molecules. And, of course, we need a place to store them. Oh, the making of new adipose tissue. Yes? All right. After I went to friendlies and had my wonderful peanut butter sundae. I decided to fast for the rest of the day or the week. No, the day. I don't want to stress myself out too much. So by the end of the day, after I've used all of the good things that I have absorbed from the digestive process, I'm kind of running out. So what am I then going to do? There you go. And what's that process called? lipolysis. And this is how it's going to fit into the scheme of things. Now some of our cells actually like using lipids just as well as using glucose for cellular respiration. Can you take a guess at some of the cells that might not mind using lipids at all? for cellular respiration? Muscles, that's right. 
So muscles don't mind using lipids at all. As a matter of fact, if you look at the makeup of a muscle, what are you going to find? Kind of dotted all the way through it. Fat. When you go to the butcher, what's the best steak? One that has marbling. Guess what the marble is? Fat. So when you cook it, it doesn't dry out because there's lots of good fat in there to keep it moist and tasty. Yes? So muscles don't mind using this. This is another way to look at what I just said. So one of the things, one of the problems with metabolism of lipids is we're going to get a waste product. The nice thing about metabolizing glucose is it's very clean, clean burning. But when I use lipids, I'm going to get some waste products. One of those waste products is what? Mm. Ketones. Ketone bodies. Okay? And ketone bodies typically are dealt with very well in the liver. So it's not a big deal if I use lipids at a nice even rate. The liver can take care of that waste product. So this is another way to look at the reactions and it breaks down for you the catabolic reactions which are the breaking apart reactions versus the anabolic reactions. The what? Building reactions. So these similar reactions can break lipids apart and can put them together again. So that's why we see both of those arrows in this reaction. So using stored fat at too fast a rate is going to result in what? Yeah, too many ketone bodies for my liver to deal with. And what can that do to your body's pH? Too acidic, because we have too much. The finger was right, but the pH was wrong. We have too much acid being produced. Ketone bodies are acidic on the acid side. So what happens to body's pH when you burn fat at too fast a rate? It becomes too acidic. Can that cause problems? Yes. It can cause lots of problems with reactions of metabolism, with protein structure, with respiratory rate, with what? If I start messing up ion balances in my body, I can mess up things like my heart rate, my breathing rate, you name it. There's a big, huge list. What's one of those wonderful diets that totes fat burning really, really quick? Yeah. In the old days, when the Atkins diet first came out, it came with a little tube of sticks that you had to pee on. Does anybody remember those? Yeah, they're ketone sticks. We give them to diabetics. You're not supposed to pass ketone bodies in your urine. If you start passing them in your urine, that means they're way too high where? In your blood plasma. Just like you're not supposed to pass glucose in your urine. If you start passing it in your urine, we know it's way too high in your blood plasma. So if you start passing ketone bodies in your urine, the Atkins diet said, yay, you're doing good. Right? But no, I'm not, because I'm in acidosis. Yes? So be careful for stuff like that. Um, burning fat should be done at a nice, even rate, a nice, slow, even rate. So if you decide you want to get rid of some extra storage, you want to make sure you do it at a nice, even rate. Okay? So, synthesis and structural materials basically talks about um, that diagram we just looked at. This diagram talks about some of the chemistry involved in dealing with those ketone bodies in the liver. 
So, oxidation of amino acids is what we're going to talk about next in proteins. But I don't, you don't have to memorize this, but we get an idea for who's responsible for taking care of those ketone bodies. Now, the ketone bodies and amino acids and a process called oxidative deamination is also going to give a waste product off called urea. And urea is kind of like ammonia. And it's one of the things that we filter out through the urinary system. Again, we want this to happen at a slow, even rate so that the liver can do its thing and detoxify some of the waste products of this particular metabolism. Okay? You with me? I didn't lose ya? Okay. So what's this diagram? Carbohydrate, fat, and amino acid pools. Because I can also use what other molecules in my reaction of cellular respiration? Proteins. So the book starts to talk about protein metabolism. Specifically, I have to kind of fool with the building blocks of proteins, which are what? Amino acids. So they talk about the oxidation of amino acids. When I have something go through an oxidation reaction, what am I doing to it? Taking them off, pulling off electrons, altering them so that they can go into this reaction of cellular respiration as well. So they talk about something called transamination and oxidative deamination, which is a series of reactions that are going to then modify this molecule. Back in that last diagram, we saw that keto acids are also involved, and this is the top line, of this diagram that shows transamination involved in altering those amino acids so that I can then use them in the reaction of cellular respiration as well. So this diagram shows the link between proteins and amino acids and carbohydrates and lipids. Now, do I want to use proteins for the reaction of cellul cellular respiration on a regular basis? Why? You want to use proteins for structural stuff. You want to use proteins for those receptors inside your cells. You want to use proteins to make your antibodies. You want to use protein for structure. So you want to use proteins in that what we call free amino acid pool to build more pro uh, excuse me, amino acids in that free pool to build more proteins because you're constantly using them to regenerate things that you have worn out. We also need them for nitrogen. Proteins are very important for that. We need to make hormones. We need to make neurotransmitters. So we want to make sure we use those for structural components. But they can also be used for the reaction of cellular respiration as well. So proteins and the amino acids that make up proteins can be broken down and altered with the help of some keto acids to feed into the reaction of cellular respiration. And those can feed in about halfway through glycolysis. So we produce something called glyceraldehyde phosphate, 
which we then can alter to make pyruvic acid and continue on the way. But what's one of the things that I'm going to build up if I use too many proteins for cellular respiration? What's a waste product? That little thing over, over here. Yeah, ammonia, urea. Again, who's got to take care of that slack or pick up that slack? The liver, the kidneys, to try and get rid of that waste product. Ammonia is, is that acidic or basic? Basic. What's that going to do to your pH? There you go. <laughs> Put your finger up. It's going to make the pH increase. It's going to mess with your chemistry again. And it's also going to stress your liver, and it's going to stress your kidneys having to deal with that waste product. Yes? Plus, you're taking, you're taking apart your building. You're breaking down structural components. So we can use them, but are they ideal? No. Another thing incorporated into this diagram is this guy over here. Yeah. When do I build up too much lactic acid? When I don't get enough what into the system? Oxygen. When I don't get enough oxygen, I'm going to kick the glycolysis department into overdrive. So I'm going to break down as much as I can in the process of glycolysis, but that's going to result in a buildup of another waste product called lactic acid. And we talked a little bit about that in the last lecture. That can cause some problems with pH. It can cause some problems with muscle contraction. It can cause some problems with uh, cramping. Okay, so you with me? So they talk then in the textbook about catabolic and anabolic steady state of the body and metabolic states of the body. So we are constantly trying to keep this whole chemical balance uh, within the body. If you look at page, at the bottom of that page 935 at table 24.5, you see a profile of the major body organs in fuel metabolism. So you see that different body parts, depending on which system I'm talking about, can use different fuels and have different fuel stores. So we're always constantly trying to maintain this balance. Just like you go to the store, right? When you go to the store, why do you do that? Grocery store, I'm thinking. Yeah, you have to maintain some sort of fuel balance in your house. So you buy some foods that you can use right away. That's in the, in the cupboard. The crackers, the cereal, the chips. You put some in a little bit long-term storage in the fridge, but you can pretty much use those right away. That's kind of like what in your body? They're easy to get at. Kind of a storage form of glucose. Who? Where do you store your storage form of glucose? Nope. Liver! What's it called? Glycogen. Now, fat, on the other hand, that's your freezer. Yes? So you're going to buy some things for long-term storage that you can use if you don't have the quick stuff available to you right away. So that's what you have to kind of think of when you think of what you're doing to help maintain all of these stores, just like when you go to the store. You want to make sure there's food in the cupboard, there's food in the fridge, and there's food in the freezer 
for immediate use, for use when I get low, for long-term use. So that's what this is talking about. Now, notice, please, your brain. How many fuel stores does your brain have? None. What's its preferred fuel? Glucose. Just glucose. It's not going to eat anything else. Fuel sources exported. None. So what happens when you, you don't have enough carbohydrates or you decide to starve yourself because you want to look gorgeous when you go on to the beach? Yeah, big time. What's one of the big complaints back to Mr. Atkins and that wonderful diet of his? Does anybody know what the basis of that diet is? Very, very low carb. Not just low carbs. Very, very low carbs. Yeah, 20, I think, is max. How many are you supposed to have, O oh, Nutrition people? A lot. <laughs> A lot more than 20. You, you should have like 250, 300 grams of carbs a day. Yeah. So Mr. 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 Atkins says 20 for you. Yes. So what do you think one of the one of the complaints? You're going to lose weight. You're going to lose weight. You will. But what's one of the problems? It, tired. Having problems thinking. Having problems concentrating. Gee, I wonder why. Yes? So it's very important to keep these um, major stores in order so that our body can function properly. And that's what the, they talk about there. The absorptive state. The absorptive state of anabolism. What's anabolism? And this is going to happen when I get all of the ingredients I need. Because when I get those ingredients, what, I'm going to, what, am I, what is my body going to do? When I get those extra ingredients, what's my body going to do with them? When you go to the grocery store, what are you going to do with the groceries? You're going to eat some because you're hungry. You might even eat in the car on the way home. I've been known to do that. Yeah. But what are you going to do with the rest? You're going to store them. You're going to prepare them for storage. When you bring in amino acids, what are you going to do with them? Or prepare them for building blocks. You're going to make proteins out of them. As far as energy goes, and that's what this diagram is, when you take in glucose, some of it you're going to use, but how do you prepare the rest for storage? Yep. If it's not in excess, you're going to take those other ones and put them in the fridge. Yes? Those are your glycogen stores. And when you bring in glycerol and fatty acids, you're going to prep them for storage by turning them into what? Triglycerides. So your major fuel or major energy fuel, the best one for the best outcome with the least amount of waste products is going to be glucose. And your liver is important for the processing of all of these other things that we get from reactions of metabolism. So these are the major events of what we call the absorptive state. And these are how we're going to treat all of those energy molecules that we bring into our body. So this is kind of the pathway we're going to take of the absorptive state. So these are all the guys that are going to be involved in the processing of foods when you take them into the digestive system and then you absorb them into the circulatory system. So of course the gastrointestinal tract, we talked about that in detail. That's going to break everything down and get it to the point where we can use it. And then muscles are going to use some of that glucose and coarse proteins to build
components that are worn out in muscle cells. Remember when we talked about muscle cells and the makeup and we talked about myofibrils and we talked about the proteins that made up those myofibrils? Do you remember what they were? Actin, myosin, troponin, tropomyosin, titan, those are all proteins. So I'm constantly having to make new and repair those guys. When I make a new cell, I constantly have to make all of those cellular receptors that we talked about when we talked about the immune system. All of those cellular receptors that are responsible for maintaining that cell, like a sodium potassium pump or a calcium pump, all of those are made of proteins. So the liver plays a big role in the processing of amino acids and protein production. And then, of course, adipose tissue, where we are going to send some of that stuff. Because adipose tissue is important. It's important insulation, it's important protection, and with respect to these chapters, it's also going to be a good fuel source, especially for muscles. So absorptive state and all of the wonderful little things that are associated with the absorptive state are discussed there. Hormonal controls. Insulin. What's insulin doing for me? We talked about insulin before, didn't we? Well, insulin is going to help me do what? We already talked about the fact that it's going to help glucose get inside cells. Remember that? But it's also going to help us do some other things, too. It's going to help activate transport of amino acids into tissue cells, too. And what do I need amino acids for? Building my proteins. So when I have insulin levels increase, I can also get more of my amino acids in. I can also increase protein synthesis. So not only in this diagram do we see what we talked about before, it's going to increase glucose movement into cells, but it's also going to help with proteins too. What else is insulin going to do? Look at the bottom of the diagram. Right around here. Yeah. So when I have a lot of it, like extra, if it's hanging around, and all my proteins are good, and all my glucose is good, ah, let's go make some fat. Yes? Has anybody ever heard of something called the glycemic index? What is that? Do you know? It's the ability of foods that you consume to raise insulin levels. Some of them raise insulin levels at a nice, slow, even pace. And some of them raise insulin levels really, really fast. Give me an example of a food that raises insulin levels really, really fast. Sugar. Processed sugar. Simple processed sugar. My wonderful peanut butter sundae. Yes? So if I have a lot of insulin very quickly in my body, I'm going to put it to work. And what am I going to put it to work doing? Yeah, making more fat. So enhances glucose conversion, if I have too much of it too, to fatty acids and, gl and glycerol as well. So those are all the jobs. So insulin's pretty busy, right? So we see the initial stimulus increase glucose levels in this diagram. We see what happens, your physiological response to that insulin level and what the results are. So some of the results are good. Yes? Get energy. But if I have too much, we get too much what? Fat production as well. Most people have too much adipose tissue not because they eat too much fat. It's because they eat too much what? Yeah. 
too much sugar, too much glucose, too many processed foods. Your body should do the processing. When your body does the processing, it uses up energy to do that. And you see that in all of these reactions. I use ATP to do this. I use ATP to do that. But if somebody just hands it to me and it's all the work is done, well then, good. All I have to do is put it in the fridge or in the freezer. Yes? So when you choose foods, you should make sure that your body has to do a little bit of work to get what you need from it. You know what I mean? So processing, the processing of foods is not good for us. You have to eat foods and recognize them. Yes? There are no Twinkie plants anywhere in the world. Yes? Do you know what I'm saying? Twinkies do not grow on trees. Even though they're tasty and yummy. So try to stick to a food in its, it, in its natural package because your body deals with them better. And then our post-absorptive state. What's that? After we do absorption, we need to replace things. We need to replenish things. And that's what the post-absorptive state talks about. So post-absorptive, after we ate the peanut butter sundae and we got all that glucose and we did with it what we will, what would be some of the other sources of glucose after the goodies are gone? And that's what sources of blood glucose talks about in your textbook on page 938. So if I need some glucose, who didn't eat breakfast this morning? Yeah, you guys. Your brain's really mad at you right now. I was going to say something else. Like I censored myself. Your brain's mad because it wants some carbohydrates. Hello, you want me to think in this class, but you're not going to give me any carbohydrates to do it. I have to get them somewhere. Where can I go first? Everything's, ev there's nothing in the cupboard. Where are you going to go search for food next? To the fridge. Go to the fridge. Yes? And what's in the fridge? Glycogen. Remember? Glycogen's in the fridge. So, glycogenolysis, breaking down glycogen from the liver, is our next step in the post-absorptive state, because I don't have any goodies right on hand, so I have to go to the fridge. Glycogenolysis. Break it down so I can get what? Glucose to use in cellular respiration. Um, muscle has glycogen stores as well. And muscle also has an oxygen-carrying pigment called myoglobin. So that's going to kind of boost the oxygen stores in muscles so that we can use these and break them down and go through the process of cellular respiration to give me the stores I need. So why would I have all this special stuff in muscles and not anywhere else? Any clue? Yeah, and they're kind of having to do their work all the time. I'll give you an example. The diaphragm, the heart. Yes? Do you need any more explanation than that? All right, so they always need to be able to get a source of ATP because they're always working. And if they aren't always working, adios. So muscles have these extra little ways of getting what they need at a faster rate. And these are some of the pigments that help them. Uh, lipolysis is my next. Once I've cleaned out the fridge, what do I have to go do? Go to the freezer. Yes? So lipolysis and adipose tissue and the liver is going to help me process that as well. Are you, are you using the liver and the 
No, because if you're using, um, you will burn off fat as well before you deplete all of your glycogen stores. Because remember, your muscles are going to say, hey, um, I don't really need the glycogen. I'm good with what I have down here. I'm all set. When you're, in, when you're in starvation mode, you're actually going to break down proteins before you break down your lipids. Yeah. Yes. Because it's easier. So when you starve yourself to lose weight, no. Not good. What's the best way to lose weight? Two ways. Number one, eat. Number two, move because remember fat muscle we're good I like using it I have no problem yes so it, to increase metabolic rate you use more energy when I need to use more energy then I'm gonna go to the storage to get it when you starve yourself you go into protection mode you're gonna hold on tight to that those stores that's like rations. You're going to break down proteins, and that's not good. Yeah. You're going to, hold, you're going to lock the freezer, and that's not good. So um, that's what that talks about. So glucose, um, glucose sparing, conserve glucose. Metabolism of, of cellular proteins is discussed on page 940. This, again, is the whole chemistry principle in the post-absorptive state. Please notice how important your liver is. So the liver, we've talked about several times, um, does a lot of different jobs. And one of the very important jobs with respect to this unit is dealing with the byproducts of processing proteins and processing waste products from cellular respiration metabolism. So very important. Uh, don't forget, your brain needs glucose. If you're tired all the time, maybe you need to get some carbohydrates in your diet. And remember, complex carbohydrates, not simple carbohydrates. Who drinks those um, energy drinks a lot? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah. It's bad, bad stuff, bad. Okay, what's better for you energy-wise? Now, now that we've had this discussion, and you're tired, and you want some energy, what do you think would be better? Or, or some kind of snack that is complex carbohydrates and with maybe a little protein shooter. You're better off having a, like a peanut butter sandwich than you are one of those protein drinks. Because they have way, way too much processed sugar. They have way too much what? Caffeine. Some of them have like mega amounts of B vitamins. No need for that. It'll, it'll, it'll wake you up but you're going to crash and it's not good for your body. So what's this diagram talking about? Glycogen. What's glycogen? Yeah, it's going to help break down stored glucose in the liver in the form of glycogen. So it stimulates glycogenolysis and it also stimulates what? Gluconeogenesis, which is kind of making new glucose from what? Breaking down glycogen. It also stimulates fat breakdown. So see, when I start using my glycogen stores, I'm also going to start using my adipose stores. So that's why I don't suck everything out. Except if I've been doing that all night long, when I sleep, because what am I doing when I sleep? Hopefully, 
I'm building, I'm repairing, I'm breathing, my heart's beating. All those things need energy to keep going. We still have to run the plant even though you're asleep, right? So you're doing both of those at the same time. To increase fatty acids in the plasma, of course, we're then going to feed that into cellular respiration as well. So these hormones can control metabolism as well. Are we good? Now we're going to talk about metabolic role of the liver. Now, we've already talked a lot about that. And if you look on page 942, we've kind of broken that all down for you in a table. Don't you just love these tables? Oh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. You're, you should know what those are. They're called chylomicrons. We already talked about them in... Uh, yeah, yeah, you get it. So... Rather than me rehash everything I already said, here it is in table 24.7. Now, the next thing they talk about in the textbook is cholesterol metabolism and regulation of blood glucose uh, cholesterol levels. What's cholesterol for? Yeah, it's an important part of every single plasma membrane of every single cell in your body. It's a structural component. It's so important, as a matter of fact, that guess what one of the jobs of the liver is? It makes it. It makes it from building blocks that you bring in during the digestive process. So, because it's such an important component, we have kind of a delivery system of cholesterol to make sure it gets to the places that it needs to get to for cellular metabolism and repair and all of that good stuff. So they talk in your book about protein, uh, excuse me, I keep saying protein, cholesterol transport. Why does cholesterol need a transport? What is it, like a VIP or something? Not quite too big. Ah, hit the nail right on the head. Ding, ding, ding. It's hydrophobic. So if I'm trying to transport you through a waterway system and you're afraid of the water, that's not going to work very well, is it? So I need a protein carrier to help transport cholesterol to where it needs to go. And we call these guys lipoproteins because they're attached to what? Yeah, lipids or fats. So these lipoprotein carriers are what we talk about next in this chapter. And you've heard of these guys. We already met the chylomicrons. Remember those guys? Those were protein carriers that helped what? In the GI tract, I hear it. I hear the rumblings and mumblings. They're going to help transport lipids where? From the intestine to the circulatory system eventually. So with the help of the lymphatic system, chylomicrons are a big transporter from the intestine. Then we have some that are made in the liver. Well, they're made in the liver, and those products are then used to make the big kahuna. That's going to be the big carrier for us, the real strong carrier for us. And you've heard these terms before. Have you ever heard of the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol? Have you ever heard of HDL and LDL and VLDL? You probably haven't heard of VLDL. That one doesn't get as much billing as the other two guys do. But these are all lipid carriers, and these are all part of the cholesterol transport system in our bodies. Now, triglycerides are our storage form. This is what we're transporting around. 
cholesterol is our what? What do we do with cholesterol? That's our structural guy. We have to transport it around too. How about phospholipids? Do we need to bring those around too? Yeah, why? They're also a very important part of every plasma membrane and every single cell of your body. So we have these carriers, they're protein carriers, that are going to help transport. The strongest of the protein carriers, because it is so much protein, is the high-density lipoproteins. And the high-density lipoproteins are the most efficient transporters of cholesterol. I kind of equate it to kids in my house. I have one kid in my house that picks up their toys and brings it to the toy box and puts them away. That's HDL. Then I have another kid in my house that kind of gets distracted halfway up the stairs and maybe drops their toy in the stairway and continues on. That's LDL and VLDL. So because they're not as much protein in composition, even though they are precursors to making HDL, they're going to transport for me too before they get converted, but they're not as efficient at their transport system. So they might drop what they're transporting in places where it doesn't belong. Like what? Ah, coronary arteries or major arteries. And that stuff starts to build up and form what? Things called plaques. Is there a picture in the book? No, I think we saw it in the cardiovascular system um, in one of those uh, updates or up close things. Um, there was a picture of atherosclerosis and plaque formation. So when you go to the doctors and have your cholesterol tested, not only did they take a cholesterol level, which should be about, I don't know, below 200 is the, the unit of, uh, of the day, but they also are going to measure your HDL, your LDL, and VLDLs, yes? And they may also look at your triglyceride levels in blood plasma as well. So you want to make sure your HDLs are what? High. And the other guys are low to have a balance in cholesterol transport throughout the body. Does that make sense? And that's what they talk about under cholesterol transport. So um, they give us some recommended levels and some of the factors that regulate cholesterol in the body. Does anybody have problems with cholesterol? It's my father's fault. Some of us are genetically predisposed to do what? Make too much. Sometimes we get too much cholesterol in our bodies because of dietary reasons, but that's not always necessarily the case. So sometimes you're genetically predisposed to make a little bit too much. And that's what a lot of the medications um, are designed to do, is kind of slow the liver's production down of cholesterol, if you fall into that category. Hmm? What can you do to help decrease your cholesterol levels? Well, first of all, if it's a dietary reason, you can alter your diet. So try to take in less cholesterol. Where do you get cholesterol from, by the way? Animals. Animals. Do you get cholesterol from plants? No. None. Zip. Because animals use cholesterol in their plasma membranes for structural components. S plants have cell walls. They don't need that structure. So you get it from animals. So what you can do is try to decrease your consumption of animals and anything associated, like a, a bunch of people said things like butter, or th those are all animal-based products, and those are high in saturated fat and cholesterol. <clears throat>
So try to stick more towards the plant end of the world. Unsaturated fat is better. Oh, um, omega-3 are essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6. They, they are things you need to ingest in order to build your triglycerides properly. Unsaturated fatty acids are better because you can break them down and deal with them better. If they're saturated, they're kind of stuck in their ways and very hard to deal with. So we just kind of pick them up and plop them places because we just don't want to deal with them unless we really, really have to. Okay? And that's, we'll have that discussion in nutrition class. You take that class. So um, that's cholesterol carriers. Energy balance is what they talk about next. Whoa. So energy intake versus energy output. Um, you'd think that we'd have this all balanced since all of our systems are all balanced and perfect and wonderful, but we don't. Um, there's some short-term controls, there's some long-term controls, but we don't really have this whole control system down very well. We have stretch mechanisms in the digestive system. When glucose levels go to certain points or go down to certain points, we release some enzymes and some hormones. But the whole system isn't perfect. So the chemicals that they talk about for regulation of nutrition these nutrition signaling releases to energy stores, starting on page 946, talks about some of the regulations in food intake. Glucose levels, chemical regulation is a big one. So glucose levels are going to then lead to hormone levels that are going to help regulate metabolism. And we've already learned about some of the hormones, glucagon, insulin, for example, and some of the hormones that are released from the digestive process, like cholecystokinin and secretin, are also going to play a role in metabolic rate. Blood components of fatty acid, blood components of amino acids, and blood components of glucose, again, are also going to play a role, all going to play a role in regulating the central nervous system control of metabolism. And remember, what was in the central nervous system that had anything to do with metabolism? Remember that pituitary gland that was hanging up there, that anterior pituitary gland? Did it have anything to do with metabolism? How? Didn't it produce some hormones that might affect metabolism? I'm thinking thyroid. Oh, yeah, thyroid-stimulating hormone. Hmm. And what did thyroid-stimulating hormone do for me? What's the thyroid make? T3, T4, yes? And what did that do to met metabolic rate? It helped to increase metabolic rate. So if the brain gets a signal that we need to increase metabolic rate, I'm going to release thyroid stimulating hormone and that's going to cause the thyroid to release T3, T4 and increase metabolic rate. You know that already, right? Okay. So long-term regulation of food intake, short-term regulation. The short-term regulation is not so fast. So when we start intaking food, what do we need to make sure we don't do? Take it in what? 
too fast because all of these controls take time to kick in, especially the chemical controls. The stretch reflex is a little bit better, but it's still kind of slow as well. So do you ever get to that point where you're really, really hungry and you go home and you start shoving all sorts of things in your mouth really, really fast? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm really full. Well, guess what? You're probably way too over full because you didn't give a chance for these systems to kick in at a proper rate. So uh, long-term regulation, things like hormones that control um, fat production, like leptins, for example, can help with maintaining or regulating food intake. But some of us don't produce enough. Some of us produce too much. So our whole food intake, the human food intake mechanisms, aren't really very well um, tweaked at this point in our evolutionary history. Then they talk about metabolic rate and heat production. What does it, that have to do with anything? All of these reactions that we're talking about, one of the waste products are what? Heat. So basal metabolism, just your regular metabolic rate, rate of reactions, gives off heat. Muscular activity gives off heat. Thyroxin, which is the thyroid hormone, epinephrine, stimulates a metabolic rate, increase heat. And where do you lose heat? All of that stuff on the blue. So radiate, you radiate heat. My husband's a good radiator. You know why? He's a guy, he's got more surface brown fat, yeah, and they tend to give off more heat, yes, than women who tend to have more deep down white fat, and what do we do with our heat? We tend to hold on to it. Why do we do that? Because what were we built for? Making babies, yep. We also lose it by evaporation, sweat. So they talk about mechanisms with respect to metabolism that help to maintain core body temperatures. I don't know why they put that in there. Maybe to make us feel jealous. But um, know all the different ways of heat exchange. Those are outlined on page 951. Radiation conduction, convection, evaporation. The hypothalamus is going to be our temperature regulator. It's going to help maintain um, normal body temperature. And it's going to get the wonderful digestive system and metabolism process in on doing that as well. So understand this diagram and the hypothalamus's role in maintaining heat mechanisms, heat promoting mechanisms. They talk about shivering, increased metabolic rate, enhanced thyroxin release, and how we get rid of extra heat. And that's all in there. And that's the end of the chapter. So, Here's the scoop. Be here Tuesday. Do not hand me any lame excuses. If you are on death's door, you better be sick enough to go to the doctor because that's what I will accept as an excuse. A doctor's note. Um, as far 